Hello and welcome to the Aspen Music Festival and School podcast, where we focus on moments of musical revelation, those sometimes dramatic, sometimes even funny, but always illuminating moments that remind us just what music is, or should be, or can be. I'm James Inverne. My guest today is a violinist, and before he lets us in on his Aspen moment of revelation, let's have him play us in with just a few seconds of his Sony recording of the complete Brahms violin sonatas. So here, with a sonata number two in A major, alongside pianist Max Levinson, is today's guest, Stefan Jakiv. Welcome to the first of our podcast of moments of musical revelation from alumni and teachers and other people associated with the famed Aspen Music Festival and School. And today I'm delighted to welcome Stefan Jakiv. Hello, Stefan. Hello, James. Great to be here. Lovely to have you. Where are you in the world at the moment since we're, we're over a newfangled high tech line? I am currently in Kansas City, Missouri, where I'm performing uh, Mozart's Fifth Violin Concerto with the Kansas City Symphony. Very nice. Well, for those listeners who don't know uh, a very little bit about Stefan, just to make him blush, he was born in Boston in 1985, and I understand has been playing violin since the age of four, and was only 12 when he made his professional debut with the Boston Pops Orchestra when Keith Lockhart invited him to play the Wynowski Violin Concerto Number no. 2. Since then, he's been all over the place with the leading orchestras of New York, Boston, Chicago, Baltimore, Seoul, Tokyo, the London Philharmonic, you name them. So we've got together to talk about an, uh, an interesting notion, which this podcast series is all about, which is moments of musical revelation. I'm always fascinated by those moments with musicians where, and indeed all artists, where you just get those odd moments. Sometimes they're unexpected, sometimes they're arranged, sometimes they come completely from left field, but somehow, and in some way or other, they they enable or even occasionally force a musician to reevaluate what making music means, what being a musician means, what the life of a musician is. And you have an interesting one, because we had a chat the other day, uh, about one of the great, and one might even use that overused, but here certainly warranted phrase, legendary <laughs> Aspen teachers, Dorothy DeLay, who was the mentor to so many great violinists. But you had a very interesting experience when you met Dorothy DeLay. Yeah. So just sort of a little bit of a background. This coming summer, 2019, will be my 10th summer at Aspen, my ninth as a performing guest artist, and my 10th because back in the day in 1997, when I was 12 years old, I spent one summer as a student at Aspen. And this was the summer when I first met Dorothy DeLay and had this kind of revelatory experience with her. I remember that she used to teach not on the Aspen school campus, but actually in the town of Aspen, in the ground floor of a church in Aspen downtown. And I remember my first lesson, I went to this church and she had kind of taken over a large section of the church. A, a big room was where she taught and there were a bunch of smaller rooms which were used as warm-up rooms for her students who were waiting for lessons. And I arrived at this church and Miss DeLay was notoriously someone who ran behind schedule. So you'd arrive at your assigned lesson time and you would wait hours and hours for your lesson. People used to joke that she was living up to her name of Miss DeLay. <laughs> and... Uh, I remember hearing violin playing coming out out of all these warm-up rooms, playing like I'd never heard before up close. Um, I was 12 years old, and prior to coming to Aspen, my my musical life consisted pretty much of just taking one-on-one -on -one private lessons with my violin teacher in Boston. So I wasn't really exposed 
to other students playing the violin, let alone students of such high level. And I remember going to these one of these practice rooms and kind of warming up and feeling nervous about my first lesson with the great Dorothy DeLay. And after waiting, I think it was about three or four hours, I was called into her room. And I remember feeling that this whole lesson experience right from the beginning felt quite a bit more formal than what I was used to. First of all, there was a pianist there waiting at the grand piano in Miss DeLay's studio to accompany me on whatever concerto I wanted to play for Miss DeLay. And I had never had a lesson before with piano accompaniment. And I told Ms. DeLay that I wanted to perform Mozart's fifth violin concerto, the first movement, which coincidentally is the piece that I'm here performing in Kansas City right now. So it's a piece that I first learned then and has kind of been part of my repertoire ever since. And what was she, sorry to jump in, but what was she like? You'd heard a great deal about her, of course, and I imagine she must have had something of a fearsome reputation. But when you actually stepped into the room and there she was, what were your impressions as an impressionable 12-year-old? Well, you know, I would actually say that I don't think she had a fearsome reputation. I think she was known for being very warm and encouraging and nurturing. And while she had this reputation, I still was very intimidated by the idea of meeting her for the first time, just because she was so renowned and had such a legendary studio. So many great violinists had come out of her studio. So I was nervous, but I remember her being very friendly and warm even though we had never really met before. You know, this was a long time ago. This is now, I guess, 22 years ago. So specific things that she said right at the beginning aren't clear in my memory, but I remember feeling like she was trying to put me at ease, which, which I think is a great thing for a teacher rather than to sort of capitalize on a sense of intimidation or, or trying to make the student more nervous, to try to make them feel comfortable and safe. I think was a wonderful thing that she did and helped me play my best in front of her. Yeah. So I played through the first movement of Mozart Fifth Violin Concerto. And when I finished, the first thing she said is that I love your performance style. I love the energy that you bring when you play. And the next thing she said, which was pretty much the end of my first lesson, she said, what I'd like you to do for next time when I see you in a few days is to write an essay about this movement that you just played. And <laughs> in this essay, tell the story of what's happening in this first movement. And I remember being very surprised, A, that the lesson was so short, and B, that all she spoke about was this essay that she was assigning me. She didn't really tell me what kind of story she wanted me to concoct, nor did she really talk about what I expected her to talk about, kind of the nuts and bolts of playing the violin, because this was pretty much what my lessons up to this point with my teacher back home had consisted of, um, kind of work, fine tuning the technique required to play the piece. So I left the lesson kind of... Hang on, sorry, so let's be clear. No music teacher had ever asked you to write an essay before, and this was not a usual thing to ask a young violin student, right? This was not a usual thing. I'd never been asked to write an essay about a piece I was playing by my violin teacher before, nor since. Um, so this is a once in a lifetime occurrence. And I left the lesson and sat down with a piece of paper and tried to create some sort of narrative to go along with the first movement of the Mozart Fifth Violin Concerto. So were you trying to do a uh, kind of musical analysis, like a kind of narrative analysis? No. Or were you, did you think, I just have to write how it makes me feel? Or but how, did you, how did you approach it? Well, it was not at all a musicological essay. Um, I, I really didn't even have the knowledge or the tools to talk about harmonic progressions or the structure of the piece. It was a much more kind of gut reaction, as you said, how does this piece make me feel? And also what kind of story can I imagine that would go along with this piece? So it was not at all analytical from a sort of theory point of view. It was much more, I would say, driven by emotion. And while I'd still have the essay that I wrote with me, there are a few things that I remember that I put in the essay Mozart's Fifth Violin Concerto is unique in that the orchestra sets out the main thematic material and the violin in an allegro 
and the violin enters rather than restating the allegro main material that is standard for concerto form the violin enters in this sublime adagio that kind of comes out of nowhere and is entirely unexpected and i remember talking about the running soft fast notes in the orchestra part that were sort of like a, a murmuring brook that was carrying along this soul narrator who's singing the slow song at the beginning of the violent entrance. So it's sort of quite elementary description of what's happening. And I remember later on in the movement, I talked about two characters that are egging each other on and teasing each other. There's a male character and a female character. And the male character is kind of gruff and stern. And the female character, I signed the male and female because one was low on the violin, the other was high on the violin. The female character is sort of pleading with the male character and trying to sort of assuage this gruffness in the male character. And I brought this essay back to my second lesson with Miss DeLay. So you came home, your parents said, how was the lesson with Dorothy DeLay? And you said, she gave me an essay. <laughs> what? Right. And then you sat down at the kitchen table and you're writing this essay. But as you're writing these things, which as you said were, I forget the exact word you used, but were very basic or in some ways kind of primitive musical analysis. But in another way, for all that, no less deeply felt. And for a 12 year old to be taking this kind of emotional journey into the music, do you remember, I know it was a long time ago, but do you remember how you felt emotionally writing this? Did you just kind of toss it off? Or as you were writing this, did it awaken those emotions in you or make you conscious of these emotions? I remember at the beginning of writing this essay, it felt a little bit like a struggle. And I felt a little bit like I was creating something that I wasn't sure was there. You know, I wanted to follow the assignment. I wanted to do what Ms. Delay told me. But it felt a little bit like I was actively trying to build some sort of story where I didn't necessarily feel there was a story. But I remember as I got more into the sections of the piece where there are clear conversation between multiple characters in the music, then it sort of took off. And I felt that this assignment really kind of was tailor-made for this piece. And now that I think back on it, I think both for this piece and also I feel that this assignment was both perfect for this piece in particular, but also was exactly what I needed at that point in my life as a young violinist. Because when I say it was perfect for this piece, when we think about Mozart, he's probably the most dramatic, not in the sense of dark drama, but dramatic in the sense of interaction between multiple characters. He's the most dramatic composer maybe ever. I mean, his operas were groundbreaking in that they didn't kind of take lofty subject matter like gods and legends. They dealt with real life people who were falling in love and scheming and deceiving each other and reconciling and having squabbles and finding their way back to each other. So this sort of human interaction really came to life when I was forced to sit down and kind of create some sort of human narrative behind mm. this story. And I think it was perfect for me in a larger sense, not just with this piece, because prior to this, as I mentioned, all the focus in my violin training had been on how to play the violin as well as I could and fine tuning my technique and figuring out how to use my hands and fingers in a way that would make the music sound as great as possible. But beauty is not necessarily always the form of expression you're going for. And this idea of finding different characters and bringing out different personalities, whether it's gruffness or sweetness or kind of tragedy or humor, this was sort of a, a palette that I hadn't been exposed to before. And more broadly, this essay, and I think what Ms. Delay was going for, was finding a way to connect in me these up to this point disconnected areas of my mind, the musical area of my mind and the kind of human area of my mind. I, I don't want to say the emotional area because I do think I was already playing with emotion, but this idea that music is kind of an expression of the human condition and to sort of forge this connection by creating a human drama in this essay to go along with the music. So what happened when you brought it back to her? How did she respond? Were you nervous giving it to her? Because it seems to me this is quite a uh, kind of naked thing to do to... to um 
you know, reveal your innermost thoughts on a piece of music. Yeah, I mean, I remember being nervous for my second lesson. I probably would have been nervous whether or not she gave me this kind of vague assignment or unexpected assignment. I was just nervous because it was yet another lesson with Miss DeLay. Um, <laughs> and I remember I gave her this, this, this manuscript that I had written and she took it and she probably only read the first like paragraph of it. And she didn't read through the whole thing and she set it down and said, great, now play it again for me. And she didn't really talk about how she felt my performance had changed. She kind of jumped right in after I finished playing into much more detailed discussions of my violent technique and my choice of bowings and fingerings. So I guess she kind of felt that what she had hoped to accomplish by giving me this essay assignment had been accomplished. And I almost feel that for her, it wasn't even that important what I had written, the fact that I had taken the time to create this narrative for myself. She wasn't looking to see if I had created the correct narrative or if I had created a story that hit some points that she thought were important. I think the whole thing was just to sort of open my mind to this connection between music and narrative, music and drama, music and kind of, not to sound grandiose, but music and the human condition. And necessarily every one of her students will have a different narrative that they come up with just because they're different people. So I really don't think she was checking to see that I had come up with a good narrative. I think she was just, just wanted to check to see that I had done it and I had taken the time to sort of draw these connections and create this story for myself. And this perhaps is real, I mean, real teaching wisdom. She hadn't prescribed anything for you. She hadn't told you how you should feel. She'd opened a door so you could poke your head through and see what was- Yeah, she had kind of sent me on a mission without maybe even her knowing what I was looking for or what I was going to find, which is the fact that I had gone down that path and kind of looked inside myself and tried to, to come up with this kind of dramatic content and this connection between the music and the drama. And do you still feel that you're on that path, that that door that was open for you in those days? Do you think you walked through Absolutely. and still on that path? I think um, I don't still write essays, uh, dramatic essays about everything that I study or everything that I play, nor do I even in my head necessarily assign storylines. But, you know, in in violin playing, just because playing the violin is so difficult, there's so much attention, both among young people studying the violin, but even among professionals, there's so much attention paid to the craft of playing the violin, to kind of ironing out all these imperfections and polishing our sound to be as kind of brilliant and beautiful as possible, that it's easy to sort of lose sight of the fact that the goal is not to present as polished a performance as possible, but the goal is to bring these composers and their humanity to life and to sort of find a way in which their universal work has a personal connection to us or the way in which we have a personal connection to these universal works. You know, people ask, you know, why play a Mozart violin concerto when it's been played already brilliantly so many hundreds of times by other violinists. And I think the reason to play it is because each violinist is different and each violinist necessarily will respond in a unique way to, to the music that Mozart has written. And I think remembering that finding these human emotions, finding these human responses to the music is what music really is all about. And that's what touches people and keeps music like Mozart relevant. That's something that I think is at the root of this assignment that Miss DeLay gave me. You know, she didn't, as I said, talk first about improving my technique or choosing this fingering or this articulation, although she did go into it later on in the summer. The first thing she did was to sort of try to get me to forge this connection or to get me started down the path of realizing that it's not about just honing one's technique, but it's about sort of tapping into these very human emotions and being able to kind of bring that to my performance. So that's something that I think about to this day. I think it's easy to fall into the trap of trying to perfect one's performance and trying to kind of get too into the weeds. Of course, the weeds are important to explore, but one also has to kind of zoom out and remember why we do all of this. Like, why do we play music? Why do we listen to music? Yeah. Because of our, of our humanity, really. 
yeah. and that it's a way of expressing this and sort of sharing this humanity and kind of making connections and realizing that we have this in common with other people and that we're not alone in the way in which we respond to music, which is kind of, I think, really why listening to music is such a powerful communal experience. This episode of Moments of Musical Revelation was produced in association with The Strad. Editing was by Tim Burton.